All right, Revelation 19 tonight. So, uh, media team, if you could get that graphic ready first, then we'll read scripture. Um, just going to kind of change up the way I introduce the message tonight. But you can take your Bibles, church, and go to Revelation 19. We'll turn to a few other passages tonight. Uh, let me add, uh, you know, an event like we're doing Wednesday night with uh, just getting together to eat is a great opportunity to invite your neighbors uh, or friends, anybody you can think of, to come and join us, even if they don't stay the whole night. It's a great, uh, we'll have plenty of food. I know we'll have some out of town, and uh, we're, I think we're planning uh, for a good number of people. We, bought a, we have a good number of hamburgers and hot dogs, and so uh, we got to eat them. So just think about that, pray about that, someone you can bring along uh, for that night. And like I said, even if they just leave after the food, they at least have, have come and, and met, met a few of us and hung out on our church property. Um, all right, well, um, just a second with that. Oh, you already got it. All right. Uh, can you take it off for one second? Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to make an introductory comments. We'll, we'll talk about that graphic, and we'll read the text, and we'll pray. We'll go right to the outline tonight. So this is uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ, is the culmination of all redemptive history uh, of, uh, for the entire age. Uh, the average Christian, however, the average uh, one of us, knows much more about the first coming of Jesus Christ than we know. Listen to me, the second coming is the focus of more Scripture. The second coming of Jesus does, uh, is exhausted in the pages of Scripture more so than even the first coming of Jesus. The, the point is the Bible was never silent on the subject. The Bible has a lot to say about this incredible event. Um, Christ's second coming to, to rule and to reign on the earth is, it, is at some point mentioned or referenced in at least 17 Old Testament books. Jesus Christ himself referred to his second coming 21 times. And, and also, what's more, is seven out of every 10 chapters in the New Testament. Seven out of every 10 chapters in the New Testament mention his second coming. For every one Bible verse referring to Christ's first coming, there are eight verses on his second coming. So now you can put that graphic on the screen if you will. Here's what we're going to see in part tonight. As I've just introduced this contrast to you between the first coming and the second coming, we will see tonight the differences between the way he came. And the first time he entered Jerusalem on Holy Week, riding on a beast of burden, a, 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 a gentle donkey. But when he comes the second time, it will be on a victorious white battle horse. Um, he's depicted as the suffering Savior with tears in his eyes, with compassion for the multitudes, uh, with mercy and love and forgiveness. But in Revelation 19, 12, he is depicted as, uh, as a conqueror with eyes blazing with judgment, uh, flaming eyes with fire and judgment. When he came the first time as he died on the cross, he wore a crown of thorns, and Revelation 19 pictures him with this crown, this heavy, amazing, intricate crown of diadems, which we'll discuss uh, briefly in a moment. And then this is the, the neatest part, and there are a few graphic things tonight, and I hope you're prepared for that, because the Bible is graphic at certain times, to, explaining the vengeance and the victory. But Jesus' blood uh, uh, on, on his enemies uh, be, uh, his sh shed blood, uh, our sin is what put him there and shed his blood. But in this passage, in the second coming, he actually has his enemy's blood on his vesture, on his garment. And that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, graphic picture of how vengeful he will return the second time. So thank you for showing that graphic. As I said, the average Christian is more familiar with the first coming because it is history. It's already occurred. And the second coming is uh, prophecy. And it lends itself to a, a bit more confusion. In fact, uh, many Old Testament prophets, the 17 books of the Old Testament in which you find prophecies about the first and second coming of Christ, um, a lot of times you'll find prophets mixing together the two events in a way that's very hard to discern in a casual reading of Scripture. Uh, it's what we call the now and the not yet implications of prophecy. 
A lot of times when prophets like Zephaniah or Zechariah or Haggai would be prophesying, they would be looking at something in a not too distant future. A, there would be a now, or in their context when it was written, a current fulfillment of that prophecy, but there would also be kind of symbolically placed in there a not yet fulfillment. And so it is this confusion. Are you all with me? I know, did you get your nap today like we talked about this morning? It is this confusion, it, it, is, it is this, as we even read the Scripture as Scripture lovers and as students of the Bible, we read these things and we're a little bit confused. Like, was that talking about the first coming or the second coming? It is, it is this that many theologians would argue is part of the trouble that has led many Jews, many Jewish people, for example, to reject Christ as the Messiah uh, because Old Testament prophecies spoke of, of a Messiah suffering but conquering. And in one passage in the Old Testament, you could read about Jesus uh, suffering for our sins, but also reigning victorious and ruling for eternity. And so because of that, many Jews thought that the suffering Savior would also become the conquering Savior in his first coming. It's, so he didn't come like they thought he would. Of course, the Bible tells us the, the, the Jewish eyes were blinded, their hearts were hardened, and so all those things worked together. But they did not realize that he would come, watch this now, the first time to suffer and the second time he would come to conquer. It's important to be a good student of the Bible. Well, now let's read, and then we'll pray. Let's read Revelation 19, verses 11, through the uh, end of the chapter, verse 21. Beginning of verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And then John says, I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Well, let's pray tonight, and then I'll preach a message to you, and we'll uh, discover these Bible truths. This message is called, The King is Coming. The King is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, just the tone of victory that we sense in Revelation 19. We've seen in our study of this book, we've seen so much catastrophe, so much judgment, so, so much yearning for this moment to occur, so much uh, of God's people begging for you to bring vengeance and make things right. And this is the moment we get to talk about tonight. And I pray that you would give us great anticipation and, and great faithfulness to you until that day. As we learn some things tonight, I pray that you would calm our hearts and give confidence to us about your word, about what you have promised to us, what we know is going to occur because you are faithful and true as you are described in this very chapter. So we believe, Lord, just as you came in the first coming, you will come again in the second coming. So encourage us and challenge us and edify us by your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
All right, church, number one, Jesus is coming back visibly. Jesus is coming back visibly. Did somebody say amen? In Acts 1, 9 through 11, Jesus Christ made a statement before he ascended that he would return the same way he left. Watch this now. When he left the first time, it was physical, it was visible, it was literal. It was phys physical, it was visible, it was literal. And we have every reason to believe that when Jesus says he's going to come back again just like the way he went, that he's going to come back physically and visibly and literally. There's the amens. All right, I got a few of you now. You're awake. So um, this is uh, the, the, the great predicted moment that, that f is fulfilled in Scripture, is going, this great predicted moment of all time when Jesus Christ returns with all his glory and we as his army behind him and to, to come and culminate this great victory and have this reign on earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will return the same way, in many ways, the way he came the first time, but he will, there will be some major differences. I also love, I want you to turn back to the first chapter of Revelation just quickly, as quick as you can, Revelation 1 and verse 7, where it says, where John says, Behold, Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Now, I guess I should, in case there's any confusion here, remind you, there really are two events that we could be referring to when we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of times we use them interchangeably. We say, I can't wait for the Lord to come again. And the, the next event on God's prophetic calendar, th there's nothing prophetically preventing this from occurring even tonight, even right now, and that is the rapture of the church. When, as Revelation 1, 7 says, he comes in the clouds, and we are gathered together to meet him in the air. This is what we call the rapture of the church. And so oftentimes we just make, make sure we delineate our terms and define what we're talking about, but we could, all, we could very well and, and very well meaning refer to the rapture as the second coming of Jesus. But that's when he comes in the clouds. This, what we're talking about here tonight in Revelation 19, is when he comes to earth to conquer. And it is, the, it is after the tribulation, which we've spent weeks and months covering. It is after all these things. We've, we've seen the book of Revelation. And it, John says, my eyes saw this in the vision. I'm telling you, according to the, the, the authority of God's word, John says every eye will see it. And can't we understand through modern technology today that it is possible through modern technology for every eye to see this event occur? And so... Um, if John said it, if the Bible says it, then I believe it. And, and even though his second coming is different from the first, they do go hand in hand. Listen to this. There is no purpose for his incarnation if there's no coming coronation. There is no reason for Jesus Christ to come as the baby and live as the perfect God-man and die on the cross as the suffering Savior if he's not going to come back at the end of all time and make it all right and rule and reign. So I'll, that's what we call the, the Christmas, the incarnation at Christmas and the coronation at the second coming. There is no purpose in the incarnation if the, without the coronation eventually taking place. In other words, why would you redeem fallen man on the cross if you don't follow through one day and be their ruler? We're waiting for this event. A, uh, a tired salesman got into his second floor hotel room about bedtime and he was exhausted. He plopped down on the bed. He pulled off one of his dress shoes and he dropped it on the wood floor with a loud thud. He thought to himself, well, that wasn't very nice or considerate. There's somebody below me, and uh, I, that was too loud, that loud thud. So he gently removed the other shoe and softly placed it on the floor. He then crawled into bed, and he was gone. He was asleep. Well, about midnight, a knock came to his hotel room door, and it was a man. Uh, there stood this man with deep bags under his eyes and dark circles, and he was exhausted, and, and he said, would you please drop the other shoe? I'm waiting. <laughs> well, all that silly story to tell you that the shoe of the incarnation has dropped. 
and now the world is groaning. All creation is groaning. We're waiting for the other shoe, the shoe of the coronation, the shoe of victory to drop. When we'll finally be able to rest, we'll finally have all the tears wiped away, we'll finally have no more sickness and no more night and no more death and no more pain. So the incarnation took place visibly. People saw it. The coronation will take place as well. It will be a visible event. And the first time he came as God in the flesh, and the second time he comes, it will be as God in charge. Well, number two, this will be our longest point tonight. A lot of things to unpack here in the verses 11 through 16. But number two, Jesus, Jesus is coming back victoriously. He's coming back visibly, and he's coming back victoriously. And I, I do love this passage. It's, it's, got, it's got some violence in it. But we understand the reason for it. That God gives people every possible chance to repent. That God is a God of grace, and God is a God of love. But sometimes God's love is seen in his grace and his forgiveness, and sometimes God's love is seen in his wrath towards sin because he's a holy God. These days make us long for Jesus to come back. Like maybe today, maybe today's the day. Um, so here he comes victorious. Notice a few things about his coming. I call letter A, victorious transportation. Victorious transportation. John sees in his vision that he records for us in this chapter, John sees a glorified Jesus on a white horse. It's been assumed this white horse also has wings, uh, but in some way, it's flying from heaven to earth. Uh, today, uh, and we wonder sometimes, uh, will there be any animals in heaven? Well, I, I think there will at least be horses and dogs, my opinion. And that's it. That's it. But th today, most people <laughs> think of, of horses as either farm animals or racehorses. However, in the ancient world, Horses were thought of as military creatures, military machines, really, used in war. So this idea of Jesus Christ coming back on a white horse, um, it contrasts sharply to that image we have in our minds of Jesus humbly entering Jerusalem on, on, on the back of, of a young donkey. He rode a donkey, a lowly beast of burden, but at Christ's second coming, that domestic animal will be exchanged for a military steed. This uh, scene also here in Revelation 19, you might think, well, didn't someone else come already in Revelation on a white horse? And you're right. In Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist comes on a white horse, faking his purity, faking his victory, lying about this. This Antichrist comes in Revelation 6 on a white horse bringing new levels of evil to the earth and this writer in this chapter comes on a white horse to reverse all those evil, uh, all those evil deeds and all that wickedness. In Revelation, the color white symbolizes judgment and victory. A white horse is clearly symbolic of a victorious general or emperor. Can you imagine? Um, literally seeing an army of white horses riding, flying through the skies and landing on the Mount of Olives where, where Jesus Christ will victoriously dismount and defeat all his enemies. Letter B is victorious names. There's a lot to cover here, but I'll move quickly. Victorious names. So the, the coming conqueror is given at least four names in this chapter. The first name is faithful and true. Everyone say faithful and true. This is so important. This is so, this is so important. We just park here for a moment because in contrast to the beast who was unfaithful and broke the covenant with Israel and in, 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 in contrast to the, uh, the false prophet and the Antichrist who ruled by means of deception and idolatry, in contrast to, to that fake deceptive leadership, we have one who is coming who is faithful and true. God is faithful and he will not lie. God is true and he will not desert us. His promises are true. Turn back to uh, Revelation chapter 3 and in the letters to the early church, um, we find Revelation 3, 14 in the church to Laodicea, the church at Laodicea, Jesus Christ, notice how he identifies himself, Revelation 3, 14, says these things 
uh, saith, Revelation 3.14, the amen, the faithful and true witness. So Jesus Christ has been called this before. He's referred to himself as the faithful and true witness. You can trust what he says. That's the point. You can trust what Jesus says. Think about that uh, magnificent war story from World War II where Douglas MacArthur left the Philippines in World War II and he made his famous statement, his famous declaration, I shall return. Um, on my own medical missions trip to the Philippines about 10 years ago, we uh, went for a day excursion to Corregidor Island and it was so cool to be there. And that was the location where Douglas MacArthur made that speech, made that I shall return speech. And I saw the statues and the things they have there. When he actually returned to the Philippines, he came to a different landing spot, did not return to Corregidor Island. But uh, I was thinking about that, like, I shall return. And just as surely as we believed a guy like Douglas MacArthur, just as surely as we might believe someone else's uh, uh, promises, to come back, we can be sure that Jesus Christ will keep this promise. Donald Gray Barnhouse told the story of a, of a lady. She was a believer. She was saved. She was on her deathbed. And someone came to visit her, and, and this lady was so sure of her salvation. It was a tremendous matter of confidence to her. And this young man came to visit her, and he picked up on her, her confidence, her absolute assurance that she would see the Lord, that she would go to heaven because of her salvation. And he warned her. This young man warned her of such confidence. And she said, quote, as Donald Gray Barnhouse told the story, young man, if I were to awake in eternity and find myself among the lost, the Lord would lose more than I would. The man asked, well, how's that? She responded, well, I might lose my soul, but he would lose his good name. Think about it. This is true. If God, even for one moment, let one saved person, let one believer who has trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ uh, to, to go to hell, then all of a sudden everything to do with God and Christ is unfaithful, it's untrue, it's untruthful, and God has lost his good name, he's lost his truthfulness, and we have lost everything. So the first name that is discussed is faithful and true. Secondly, verse 12 says there's a mystery name. There's a mystery name. Now, what is there to say about a name we don't know what it is? Well, here's what it points out. It points out there are things about Jesus we still don't know. There are things about God. There are things about eternity. It reveals to us here that our human minds, this side of heaven, cannot grasp all that there is to know about Jesus. And the more we get to know Jesus, the more we love Jesus, and the more we want to serve Jesus. And this title reveals that there is a limit to what we know about Jesus on this side of heaven. There is a containment to our imagination. Jesus has a mystery about him that we will not completely know until we are face to face with our Redeemer. In fact, Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, now we see through a glass darkly, we see through tinted glass, we see through a one-way mirror in effect is the actual idea there. We see through a glass darkly, but one day face to face. One day I shall know him and he shall know me and I will be known, uh, I will know him even as I am known. How does God know you? How does Jesus know you? He knows everything about you and one day you and I will know everything about Jesus. It's a mystery name. But we gain some insight one day into who Jesus truly is and more. How exciting to, to still be learning about Jesus in heaven. Learning new things about our Lord. The next name, church, is the word of God. Verse 13 says, uh, that he's called the Word of God. That's a strange thing to call a person. This is a title reserved alone for Jesus Christ. Everything he is, everything he does, everything he says is the Word of God. The Word of God, Logos, really. The Word of God is one of the more familiar concepts or names about Jesus in Scripture. And just as, get it, follow this logic with me, just as we reveal 
our minds and, and our thoughts by our words to those that we love, so the Father reveals His love and His plan to us through words, through His Son, the Word of God, the incarnate Word of God. Why is the Word of God exciting? Because when one day Jesus Christ became the incarnate Word of God. God always wants His Word incarnated. He always wants His Word having life to it. God forbid I ever preach with, with boredom or with, without heart or without passion because God always wants the truth of the Word of God, just like Jesus came to life, wants that Word of God to come alive even today in our congregations. A Word is made up of letters. Revelation calls Jesus Christ the Alpha and Omega, letters of the Hebrew alphabet. He is the divine alphabet of God's revelation to us. What if, what if someone thought so much about your Christian life that they just called you, hey, Bible, hey, Bible, hey, Scriptures, hey, Word of God, does your, the point is this, does your life so reflect the Bible that you could be called the Word of God? Well, you truly might be the only Bible someone gets to read or see. And then in verse 16, the fourth name here, these victorious names, the fourth is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Um, I want you to notice this, just to have a little bit of fun here that on his vesture, verse 16, and on his thigh, a name written. Uh, maybe you should change what you believe or may believe about tattoos because he's got a name, King of Kings, and Lord, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to preach on that, okay? But uh, if you ask me about tattoos, maybe you should look at that verse. Um, I still don't, okay, there's kids here. They're not a wise idea. All right, there we go. We all Okay. Okay. Except the one you got on your cruise, right? You got a little fake tattoo on your cruise, yeah. And he was so proud to show me. And I almost fired him. All right. There's a, on his thigh and on his clothes, King of kings and Lord of lords. Of all the kings and all the rulers that have ever lived, Jesus Christ is the King of kings. He is the God king. I love this phrase. He is the Lord God king over all. There's nothing that is not under his rulership. Nothing that is not under his ownership. No earthly ruler is any match for total deity, total royalty, all wrapped up into one with complete authority. No, no earthly ruler could ever match this. That's why the Bible says that ultimately in a day like this we're studying right now that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Imagine that day if we get to see Hitler and Saddam and Caesar and Nebuchadnezzar and Osama and Obama. Any ruler unable to hide, unable to keep themselves from falling to their knees. Third thing we understand about this uh, victorious return, we've seen victorious names and victorious transportation. Number, a letter C, rather, is victorious clothes. Victorious clothes. The Bible says in uh, 12 and 13 that he will be uh, uh, wearing a crown on his head. Watch it now. Visualize it. Were many crowns. Now the Antichrist wore a crown. The Antichrist crown is more of the leafy, garlandy looking crown that we think about when we think about the Corinthian games or the Olympic games that, that began, those uh, the Isthmus games that began in Rome. And this, this word here, we have the word in our, um, the word is actually diadem. In the Greek, it's a crown of diadems. Now, this is a legit, I mean, many, many crowns. This is heavy. This is a real crown. It's a, in, in his uh, crucifixion, of course, we talked about on the screen, he was given a crown of thorns. And now this is a crown of diadems, a kingly crown of jewels. And then we also want to notice under victorious clothes here, he will be wearing a robe dipped in blood. Let's just make sure we see this in verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture or a robe dipped in blood. All right. Look up this way. When, when I first read this, it really, it really blessed me. And we sang about the blood tonight. We sang 
nothing but the blood. Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. Someone that we sinned against. We don't deserve anything but a hot place in hell. Someone loved us that much to not only give us something or to buy us something, but to lay down his life and shed his blood. Jesus gave his blood for me and for you. He bled so you wouldn't have to. So I believe those blood-stained garments we read about here in Revelation 19, I believe those blood-stained garments point two directions. I think one looks backward to the cross of Calvary and one looks forward to the blood of the enemies. One looks forward to the blood of victory. It's not Christ's blood on, that, on his clothes. He doesn't suffer any injury or any wound in this battle. It's the blood of the enemies. He's not, he's not coming, it's not Christ's blood, he's not coming this time for redemption, he already did that at the cross. He's coming this time for coronation. He's coming this time for judgment. And so this is not, this, this robe dipped in blood is not some kind of memorial from the cross, though I do believe uh, we, we think so of the blood of Christ or just the cross and looking back to his shed blood for us. It's not a memorial, but it is the fulfilling of so many prophecies that tell us that literally the blood of Jesus' enemies will stain his clothes. I want you to see it. Go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63, and we'll look at 1 through 5, 1 through 6 perhaps. Isaiah 63. And uh, just pick up on, on the graphic nature of this, but the victorious nature as well. Um, Isaiah 63, 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore out art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine, the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And we'll stop right there. But I want you to see that, that these garments that Christ is wearing, just like it says in Revelation 19, it's been prophesied, it's been predicted by Isaiah and others, many, many others, other prophets, that this blood, that it will, his garments turn red like one who treads on grapes in the winepress. Jesus Christ, get it now, is seen victoriously in part because the blood of his enemies is splattered all over his garments. Now keep that in your mind as we talk about letter D is victorious armies. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. All right, here, listen. Jesus is not alone in his conquest. He doesn't come back alone. And certainly there might be angels that come with him, but I'll tell you who else is with him. We are. We are. We get to accompany the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Do you ever have your, uh, like, like somebody pick on you and you got your dad to go talk to their dad and, and, uh, and then you, but you're just back there like you're, you're this little scrawny little kid and you're, and, and, and you're now living vicariously through the victory and through the authority and through the rulership of, of someone much, much more powerful than you. And you're just some puny little kid and you're like, yeah, I could beat you and your whole family. Because now you are not victorious on your own or in your own merit. You are victorious because of someone else. And I want to be on his side. I'm on, I'm on that guy's side. And I'll follow him to battle anywhere. So here we come. Here, Jesus Christ has not come alone. The armies of heaven ride with him. And, and we, the, the big question, of course, is who are they? Well, certainly they might be angels. But so are the, the, the saints. Jude, in Jude 14, 15, describes this exact same scenario. And these armies, and I don't want you to miss it, this is going to bless you, bless some of, somebody here tonight, because it blessed me, that the Bible says we have some kind of definite resemblance to our leader. We're on a white horse. Do we deserve to be on a white horse? 
We are clothed in fine, white, righteous garments. Understand this. There's no blood on our clothes. There's no blood on our garments. We don't have to die for ourselves. Someone else died for us. We don't have to fight this victory. Someone fought this victory for us. Someone already won this victory for us. We're dressed. We're coming behind this, this victorious white horse, this victorious, faithful and true of the word of God and his mystery name. We're coming behind this, this, this victorious Christ and we're just on that white horse and we're just along for the ride. As the word of God literally proceeds out of his mouth and knocks down all the enemies. And here we are dressed in, in garments that symbolize our purity and our righteousness. John sees this. He hears this. By the way, Revelation 19 has so many things. I saw and I heard. I saw and I heard. This is real, folks. There are so many sights and sounds, and we'll be here for all of this. He sees millions and millions of white horses galloping across the sky toward Jerusalem. The king is coming. Amen. And with him, the saints. What a blessing that we do not have stain on our clothes. And it will be unnecessary for the army to fight, for Christ will defeat the enemy by himself. And then, lastly, just quickly here under this second point, victorious weapons. Victorious weapons. All he has to do is speak. Just like creation. And God said, let there be heavens and earth. Jesus speaks. His enemies are obliterated. Listen, the same word of God that offers grace brings wrath. The same word of God that offers grace brings wrath. It's the word of God. That's his victorious weapon. Guess what your victorious weapon is? The word of God. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Lord. And number three will be done tonight. Jesus is coming back vengefully. He's coming back vengefully. Now, this is where it gets a bit graphic. All the junior high boys are, are here for this. All right? They perked up. This really is an interesting part of the story. Obviously, the Battle of Armageddon is in view here. Before the battle even begins, before one missile is launched, before anything is attempted to be hurled at the incoming army from heaven. An angel, we see this in verse 17, an angel standing brightly, probably not standing literally in the sun, but standing brightly in some sort of noticed position. This angel announces the victory. Here's what the angel says. Not, hey, we won. Nay, 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 boo, boo. Our God reigns. When he rolls up his sleeves, not putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. Here's what he says. He says, come and get it. Who's he talking to? The birds. Everything is for the birds. He's telling the birds and the fowls of the air that there's about to be a large meal available to them in the valley of Megiddo. Again, this is another fun contrast we want to make sure we understand that we've already seen in previous chapters the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is called the supper of the great God. Marriage supper of the Lamb, supper of the great God. So birds, this angel says, come and get it. And let's just finish verse 17. Saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves unto the supper of the great God. So if you're not picking up what I'm throwing down here, birds are, are supposed to come at the beckoning of this angel to come and feast on the mounds of dead bodies, the heaps of dead bodies that are occupying this field. wonder how it smells. So the marriage supper of the Lamb has to do with our relationship to Jesus Christ, but the great supper, the supper of the great God, has to do with Jesus Christ's judgment of evil. And these suppers are in sharp contrast to one another. One being a meal for us, the other being a meal for the birds. Isn't that great? One, one is a supper of joy, and one is a supper of judgment. Like when I met Sophia's boyfriend for the first time, it was at a meal. It was a supper of judgment. No, it was actually a supper of joy. I, I love the boy. 
But you understand the contrast between these two suppers. One is a, a great occasion of joy and celebration, and one is one you don't want to be a part of. Well, where's the food? Well, the food is arriving soon. It's very fresh from all around the world. This redefines international cuisine. What irony. Those who attend the wedding feast of the Lamb get to enjoy the supper. Those who march against Christ at Armageddon are the supper. You either enjoy the meal or you are the meal. And Ezekiel tells us, the prophet Ezekiel tells us, that after the birds gorge themselves on the millions of dead bodies, it will take the Jews seven months to bury all the bodies and clean up the field. And so sometime as we wrap this up, sometime between verse 19 and 20, the beginning and ending of the battle occurs very, very quickly. Why? Because the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it accomplishes the victory if you'll just apply the right weapon. Jesus Christ speaks, and it's over. But there's a couple of guys we've got to clean up. According to the passage, all the people that make up the invading armies are killed except two men. They're Satan's henchmen. They're the leaders of this great revolt. It's only right that they be captured and confined and dealt with properly. And the Bible says they are cast alive into the lake of fire. More about that coming in Revelation 21, 20 and 21. They are cast alive in the lake of fire, which is the final and permanent judgment resting place for all who refuse to submit to Jesus Christ. The Antichrist and the false prophet are the henchmen. And they are the first persons cast into hell. The lake of fire is eternal hell. And Hades is the temporary hell where the lost dead are now. We talk about people dying without Christ going to hell. They're technically in a temporary hell that will one day, after the thousand year millennial reign, all that's rolled up with Satan and cast into the lake of fire, also referred to as the bottomless pit. Satan will follow them, the false prophet, the Antichrist, 1,000 years later to be joined by all those whose names are not found recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. I hope that's helpful for you. I hope that's encouraging and thought-provoking. Martin Luther said there are only two days on his calendar. There was today, and there's that day. When he said that day, he was referring to the day we just discussed in Revelation 19. He was speaking of that day when the Lord returns the second time. So may we approach life the same way. Are we living only for today? Or are we living for that day? If you're here tonight, you don't know Christ as Savior, this is as strong a warning, as strong as a deterrent as I could ever share with you. All the, the goriness of it notwithstanding, it's not too late. But one day it will be too late. But it's not too late right now to repent of your sins and call upon the name of the Lord to save you and to join his army and be victorious because he's victorious. But one day it will be too late. And once that day is here, there's nothing after that. There's no more chances. We can help you with that tonight. You can meet me in the lobby afterwards. Find me in this building after church. And I can introduce you to the victorious, suffering, sovereign Savior who's coming back one day. And he makes salvation available to you. Let's pray. Uh, would you stand with me to your feet? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. Just quickly tonight as we pray, just no invitation or anything like that tonight. No uh, and we don't need any music, but let me just ask you, 
to think about that phrase. Believer here tonight, are you living for today only or are you living for that day? Living with eternity's values in view. It changes our priorities, changes our practices. If you're asking for prayer tonight, if you recognize that you've been living for the temporal, for the temporary, for the immediate, and not for the eternal, and not for that day, and you'd like some prayer tonight for a change of perspective and a change of priority, would you raise your hand tonight? That you'll live for that day. God bless you. Let's pray. We'll be dismissed. Lord, God, thank you for the scriptures and, Lord, for this journey we've been on uh, through Revelation. Thank you for those who listen so well and take notes and process things and and, Lord, are, are seeking to be blessed by you. As the Bible says, Revelation, as we understand Revelation and, and read it and heed it, we will be blessed. The reader will be blessed if he understands it. And I pray that you'll increase our understanding. But, Lord, not just our, our knowledge, but our behavior, our, our attitude and, and inclination to do what's right and to live for you and to witness to those around us and to, to be the Word of God to those that don't have a copy, to be the word of God to those that never would read it, to warn them of impending judgment, to warn them that one day uh, it will be too late. Lord, we ask that you'll uh, light a fire under our, in our souls, in our hearts, ignite a passion for living for that day, living for the day when you call us home, living for that day when we see this great victory occur in the Holy Land. I pray for anyone here today who is off in their priorities, misplaced perspective, they're focused so much on the here and now, they're not living for the, the hereafter. You'll help them to get their priorities in line with eternity's values. As I close, God, I pray that you would save those that are lost here in the service tonight, those in our church, those watching via live stream, they would sense, Lord, you would draw them to yourself. They would sense their lostness, sense their need of a Savior, maybe gain assurance of their salvation, but call upon you, victorious Savior, to save them. We pray that you'll bless our week and the things that are before us. Help us keep our eyes on you. And we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Good night.